Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, go on. Program number four, and uh, then we'll be through for the afternoon. Again, for those of you out in television, we used to announce it kind of routinely because you remember it was kind of a joke in our early programs. People thought I only had one shirt. But uh, the reason was we taped four programs in succession, and I've always said I wasn't going to try to kid with people and fool them by running out and changing shirts between programs. But we do. We tape four programs in succession on a Wednesday afternoon, and we have some Indiana folks. I didn't think to introduce them at the beginning of the afternoon, but we have some snowbirds from Indiana on their way to southern Texas, and we're glad to have them this afternoon. And so for anyone out there on TV, if you're ever coming through Tulsa and uh, it winds around the first Wednesday of the month, well, give us a call and uh, confirm first our taping date. We'd love to have you come and join us. Okay, now normally we don't promote products. I did it once or twice before several months ago. But uh, our book, Question and Answers, I think we can get this on the screen or on, get it up close if you can. <clears throat> it's 88 questions, isn't it? 88 questions, and the answers have been compiled by a gentleman out in uh, Indiana from our past program materials. And uh, it has just gone over tremendously with our television audience. Uh, we've sold thousands already. But uh, the reason we want to remind people it's available, it will be in the bookstores. Christian bookstores are going to be holding it. And uh, pass the word, because uh, we're not going to make any more on it that way than we do now. But nevertheless, we can reach people that way that are not in areas where uh, we're on television. So we trust that the Lord will use this, because we find young and old. My, how many grandparents haven't called to tell us that one of their younger grandchildren have picked up the book off the coffee table and uh, start thumbing through it. And the first thing they say, Grandpa, can I take this with me? And uh, that happens over and over. And so we've had people call back and uh, order as many as how many, honey? 25. As many as 25 for uh, their family and friends. So it has really filled a niche. Just uh, look for the questions and answers, the Q&A book, as we call it. Okay, let's continue on now for the rest of the afternoon where we were in 1 John chapter 5. And this half hour, I want to address the triune God. As I mentioned in the last program, we get so many questions in various concepts of the Trinity. Was Jesus a part of the Trinity? Was He God? Was the Holy Spirit? God. Are they all equal? Just what's the deal? What about the Trinity? So we're going to take a look at that for this half hour, but let's start off with 1 John chapter 5, verse, let's just look at verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, which according to John's Gospel is God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now, if you have a margin in your Bible, it will tell you that there are a lot of the ancient manuscripts that do not have this verse, and so that raises a little bit of suspicion about the validity of them. But nevertheless, it's, it's a, an appropriate subject. The triune God, is it what we claim it is? And how can we show it? from Scripture that we have all three as God. Now, the best place to start, of course, is Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Now, there are those today that are promoting the concept that the Holy Spirit is not a person and that He's not a part of the Godhead. Well, I beg to differ. The Holy Spirit has been with our Bible from chapter 1 of Genesis. Starting at verse 1. In the beginning... Whenever it was. Whenever I teach this verse, you know what I always say. Nobody knows when it was. What difference does it make? Whether it was 6,000 or 6 million, that doesn't make any difference to me. All the Bible says that in the beginning, God, the triune God, that's the word Elohim in the Hebrew. And Elohim is a plural word. All right? So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now look at verse 2. The earth was without form 
and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In other words, it was covered with water. And now look at the last part of the verse. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. The what? The Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And so he was already there at creation. Now we've studied other verses where it shows so plainly that God the Son called it into, into being. But nevertheless, I want to establish first right here in Genesis that the Holy Spirit was a person of the Godhead. He is one of the three. All right, now let's come all the way up, if you will, to Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. Now there again, have you ever noticed in Scripture how often the number three pops up? All the way through Scripture. And even in life, even in our secular world, three is a pretty common number. The whole game of baseball is based on what? Three strikes, three outs, see, and, and many things. My wife is a nurse, especially when she was in a hospital that had a large maternity business. Oh, over and over. How many babies came at a time, honey? In groups of three. I mean, it was just amazing how many times she'd come home. She says, well, same thing. We had three babies in the last 24 hours. Well, it's just one of those sidekicks, you know, that three is, is an intrinsic number. The very makeup of, of water. What is it? Three different composites, ice, steam, and water, and uh, a chicken egg, the shell, the yolk, the white. And I could just go on and on how many times three is an intrinsic number in Scripture. And I think it all comes from the triune God. I really do. It, there's a connection. All right, so now then in Exodus chapter 3, same way with Scriptures in the Bible. That's what made me think of it. Exodus chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3. Those are all tremendous chapters. All right, now in Exodus chapter 3 then, we have Moses approaching the burning bush. And I think we may have looked at this in a previous program. And here he's been on the backside of the desert now for almost 40 years, herding sheep. And then one day he notices a bush on fire, but it's not burning. It's not being consumed. And so he steps aside as he approaches that burning bush. The voice says, draw not nigh, verse 5, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now here it comes. Moreover, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now look at verse 7. And the, what's the word? The Lord. See? Now we skip from God to Lord, just in a matter of a period. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction. And then you come all the way down through this to verse 12. And again we come back, or even verse 10, we come back to the word God. Well, was this just haphazard writing? No. This is to show us that these persons of the Godhead are synonymous, and yet they're acting as one. They're separate personalities, and this particular one is going to be God the Son. Now, we saw in Genesis chapter 1, God the Holy Spirit moving on the face of the deep. But here we're dealing with God the Son. All right, come all the way down to verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, they'll say to me, What is his name? Then what will I say to them? And how does God answer? God said to Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now verse 15, and God said, that same personality in the burning bush. 
He's God. He's Lord. He's I am. All three. All right. Now then, let's go all the way up to John's Gospel. You know where we're going to go next. We've done it before. And we'll probably do it again. John's Gospel, chapter 8. John's Gospel, chapter 8. Now we're up to the earthly ministry. God the Son has taken on human flesh, as we saw in the last program, in the fullness of time. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, made under the law, to fulfill the Old Testament promises of being the Messiah and the King of Israel. All right, so now we're in that earthly ministry when He's presenting Himself to the nation as their promised Messiah, and uh, especially the, the Pharisees in their unbelief did everything they could to snub Him, to try to embarrass Him. And then when you come down to verse 52 of John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 52, Then the Jews said unto him, Now we know thou hast a demon. Abraham is dead, the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets who are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? All right, then come on down to verse 56, just for sake of time. And Jesus responds with, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it, and he was glad. In other words, Abraham had an understanding through faith that this Son of God would one day be the Messiah and King and Redeemer of Israel. Now, he certainly didn't understand all the ramifications of the work of the cross. He couldn't have. But he did understand that through the promises of these covenants, that out of him would come a nation of people which would bring about this Messiah, the Son of God. All right, so he saw all this. Now the Jews come back in verse 57 with just stark amazement. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. Well, of course not. He was only about thirty. You're not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham two thousand years ago? Then Jesus said unto them, Now here it comes. Remember what Exodus 3 said, When the children of Israel ask my name, you tell them, I am hath sent you, me unto you. All right, now here's the answer to who is the I am. It's God the Son. It's Jesus of Nazareth as we know him in the New Testament. All right, so Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. He was the pre-eternal, pre-existent Son of God, right along with the Holy Spirit. And now we got the third one. Which one? The Father. All right, now let's chase down a few verses on the Father. Come all the way back with me if again to the Old Testament. Isaiah, chapter 9. Isaiah, chapter 9. Isaiah, chapter 9, we'll drop in at verse 6. All got it? Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us... Now remember, Isaiah was a Jewish prophet writing to the nation of Israel, so the us pertains to Israel. Unto us, the nation of Israel, a child is born. Now this, of course, is prophecy leaping over to Bethlehem. A son is given. Now I tie that in with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He what? He gave primarily to the nation of Israel in His earthly ministry. All right? And so He gave to the nation of Israel Jesus the Christ, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the Son of God. All right, but read on. The government 
of this royal family and this king and the kingdom over Israel, that government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called. Now here comes what was so intrinsic to Israel's belief system, the name. And his name, when he's king of kings and lord of lords and has set up his kingdom and he's ruling from Jerusalem, his name shall be called Wonderful, Consular, the what? Mighty God. See? The mighty Elohim. The everlasting what? Father. All names of deity, but it's going to be epitomized in God the Son, the King. All right? So his name should be called Wonderful, Consular, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Now, you know, the Middle East is all ablaze with peace. Oh, how they want peace. And I don't blame them. Wouldn't it be great if both sides could go to bed some night and not have to worry about getting blown to bits? But I don't think it's going to happen. I just don't think they're ever going to get any kind of peace in Jerusalem or the area of Palestine until the false Christ, the Antichrist, will come up with a short-term pseudo peace. And uh, that, of course, will be after we're gone, so we won't see any of that anyway. But uh, that's the only peace that I can see coming to the Middle East. And that's only going to last three and a half years. And then after the three and a half years, again, all, excuse the expression, it'll be hell on earth. We'll break loose. And it will bring in those final three and a half years of wrath and vexation. And then when Christ returns and sets up his kingdom, the Middle East and the world in general will finally have peace because that's going to be the whole hallmark of that kingdom. It's heaven on earth. It's going to be peace on earth, but not until. All right, so now then, read on in verse 7. And so an increase of his government over this glorious kingdom and peace there shall be no end. He's going to rule from the throne of David, which of course was on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Now you remember a program or two back, we were in Zechariah. And the, uh, the Gentiles said to the Jew, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Where? In Jerusalem. This is all tied together, see? All right. And so he will establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of the Lord of the hosts will perform this. All right. Now let's just go ahead a chapter or two to chapter 11 and see again how the other person of the Trinity is also going to be involved in this glorious kingdom, and that'll be the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 11 now. We might as well start verse 1, hon. Isaiah 11, we'll just start with verse 1. And there shall come forth, hasn't come yet when Isaiah writes, but it's in the future, prophecy. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Jesse, you remember, was the father of King David. And out of that royal family, a branch, capitalized. It's another one of the terms for Christ in the Old Testament. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. That's God the Son. Now look at verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. In other words, not only will he be the visible, physical king and ruler of Israel, but he will also have what? The Holy Spirit. And all the seven attributes of the Spirit will be on this branch, or God the Son. And it will make him then, the next verse says, of quick understanding. All right, now then as you come up through the Old Testament and we go on into the New again, uh, I suppose I should stop a second and finish what I didn't finish in the last program, which I want to do right up front, but we can do that in here because I'm going to be working up to Christ's baptism anyway. Come up here with the New Testament now and go over to Luke chapter 3. I should have done it at the beginning of the program. Just shows how human I am. Forgot all about it. 
I just happened to think I put this on the board during the break time, that here we have David. Back in 2 Samuel is promised that out of him will come a royal family, a house, and that's why we call it the house of David. Now, at the end of our last half hour, we went to Matthew, and we noticed that that genealogy coming out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, jumping up to David, and then following it on down, in Matthew, the genealogy follows Solomon. And Solomon's genealogy takes us down to Joseph, who is the legal father of Jesus of Nazareth. Not the physical, the legal. All right, now let's go then, if you will, to Luke chapter 3, and we're going to look at the physical side. And you remember I was tying it with blood and water. This over here is from the male side. This is the blood side. This is his deity. Now we're going to flip over to his humanity, his physical side. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 23. All right, now this genealogy speaks of Jesus at the age of 30 being as was supposed, not literally, because that was only from the legal side that he was the son of Joseph, who was the son or son-in-law of Heli, who was the son of Mathat, and so on and so forth. Now, just to show you that this is a different family tree, I want you to come all the way down to verse 31. who was the son of Malia, who was the son. Now, you've got to remember this genealogy is going from Christ back. All right, now we're coming all the way down from the time of Jesus through the kings of Israel and everything, all the way back now to David. But before we get to David, who do you see? Nathan. That's why I've got these two sons up here. Solomon, and these are both sons of Bathsheba, remember. Solomon is in the lineage of Joseph, and that genealogy only goes back to, to uh, Abraham when we have the beginning of the concept of the nation of Israel and this spiritual king and kingdom that's coming on the earth. Now we're over with Mary's genealogy, and it's the physical, the flesh, the water. All right, now Nathan, who was the son of David, who was the son of Jesse. And you keep going back and back and back. Now you come all the way down to verse 37. We're at Methuselah, see? All the way back in the genealogies. Now we're back to Methuselah, who was the son of Enoch, who was the son of Jared, who was the son of Malil, who was the son of Canaan, who was the son of Enos, who was the son of Seth, and don't forget, Seth took the place of Abel. And he was the son of Adam. And he came from God. All right, now do you see the difference in those two genealogies? The one only goes back to Abraham because that's the beginning of the promises made to Israel concerning a king and a kingdom. That's his deity side. Over here, we go all the way back down through Nathan, but we go all the way to Adam. That's his physical side. Born of the woman. Flesh. See? And so that's why I can sit here and proclaim without apology that he was the God-man. Born of water in the physical element, but born of blood by virtue of his birth from God himself. All right, now I said we were going to be in, in Matthew anyway. Now I want to come back and again looking at the three persons of the Godhead and we'll go all the way up to Jesus' baptism. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And anytime somebody asks you to prove from Scripture that we have three persons of the Godhead, this is one good place to start. 
Matthew chapter 3 and uh, at Jesus' baptism. Verse 15. And Jesus answering said unto him, that is unto John the Baptist, Permit it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, the whole program of God had to be consummated here with Christ's earthly ministry that was just beginning. So John permitted him. Now here's what I want you to see. Verse 16. And Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mary, the legal son of Joseph, out of the line of David, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the, what? Spirit of God, the same Spirit we saw in the Old Testament, moving upon the face of the waters in Genesis 1, the same Spirit that comes upon the branch in Isaiah chapter 11, the same Spirit of God that now makes his appearance descending on God the Son in the form of a dove and lighting upon him. And then here comes the third person of the triune God, the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now there you've got all three persons of the triune God. All right, now I'm going to give us one more before we run out of time. Now we're going to come into Paul and come all the way up to Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians, chapter 5. And we certainly know with all the reference that Paul makes to the Holy Spirit, that he is a person of the Godhead according to Paul's writing. But now these are two terms that I like to tie together as well, and we're going to have to wind it down. Ephesians 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father, but in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there you have the Father and the Son, you have the Spirit evident throughout the rest of Paul's epistles, and so without apology, we can claim a triune Godhead. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.